Welcome back to chapter 19, part 2. Here we're going to explore Darwin's big ideas. Um, so, as we talked about before when we were starting part 1, we, we were mentioning the concept of descent with modification, and the way that that happens is by natural selection. Um, natural selection does explain those three broad observations about nature that we talked about before. The unity of life, how living things have a lot in common, the diversity of life, how things are also very, very different, and also the way that organisms seem to be suited for or fit into their environments. So um, Darwin did use the phrase descent with modification in, oh, there's a little typo, the origin of species. That's a little typo there. Sorry about that. To um, summarize what he thought of the unity and diversity of life. He thought evolution as uh, descent. And when we say descent, we're talking about shared ancestry, which results, of course, in shared characteristics. You know, you have some of the characteristics of your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents. But also he thought about evolution as modification, that is, accumulation of differences. Yes, you have things in common with your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on, but you are not exactly the same. So that's where the idea of modification comes in. Darwin thought about the history as, of life as like a tree, and that common trunk represents shared ancestry. The branches are the diversity among species. In this example, in this kind of analogy, the tips of the branches represent present day organisms. And um, if a branch was like uh, unlabeled or it kind of didn't keep going or branching, that would be an extinct group. Each fork in the tree represents the most recent common ancestor in the lines of that branch. Um, we could also think about how fossils of extinct species help kind of fill in the gaps here. So let's take a look at what Darwin think. Remember, remember he said, I think. Here's his this common trunk here, and here's a branch. So this leads, leads to this kind of group and diversity, and um, this one leads over here, and so forth. Um, if we look at a more modern day representation of this, we can see that um, here's the common trunk. And um, uh, these are uh, like, this is a manatee over here. And then here is an elephant. And did you, did you know manatees are related to elephants? Um, of course, this elephant here doesn't live anymore. It's extinct. And you can kind of see by how that line kind of dead ends before the the you know the common air like right now these are the two the two or three elephants that exist in time right now um mammoths went extinct you know maybe ten thousand years ago or so and and so forth so so if you think about all these elephant-like organisms and how they had a common ancestor and are probably related to some of these only um fossilized organisms that 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 are kind of a little they're kind of, they're pretty different between um between elephants and of course the manatees but there is a common ancestor that you can see right here that shows the common ancestor you might have heard of the term artificial selection and artificial selection is simply a way that humans modify and have control over organisms for generation after generation after generation through things like selective breeding and saying, oh, I want this trait, but not that trait. That's, that's what artificial selection is. But Darwin argued, and of course, in Darwin's day, they knew all about artificial selection. They had lots of different types of dogs back, you know, 150 years ago. But Darwin argued that there was a similar process happening in nature where you might have an original design and some modifications on that. So this original wolf modifications are this gun hunting dog or a companion dog, a fighting dog, a, a hound hunter dog, different modifications of that. So what Darwin thought was that um, there is this original type and from that original type you get different things selected for. Now as humans we have we have done this 
uh, right? Did, wait, did you know? <laughs> did you know that broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and kale and cauliflower, kohlrabi, these are all basically descendants from a human selected wild mustard. Um, the, the stem, like the swollen stem would give you kohlrabi. Um, the flowers and stems that they were selected for to get bigger and bigger, that would get you broccoli. Or the, the, the very end tip of that would get you, if that was um, selected for it to be bigger and bigger, that would get you cabbage. Or these little buds along the side of the stem that would get you Brussels sprouts. Or maybe you just wanted the big leaves to eat them, that would get you kale. So again, we as humans knew this, we know this, and all that Darwin said was, hey, you know, same processes are happening in nature that, that humans are controlling. It just doesn't require human intervention. So um, with this idea um, of, of seeing what happened with human control, um, Darwin came up with his first observation, and this is very important. The first observation is that members of a population, they're not exactly the same. They have variation in traits, and it's important that these traits are inheritable, that you can pass on this more orangey color compared to this more yellowy color. You can pass on the bigger spots compared to the little spots. So observation one, members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. He also observed that all species, and this is, this is literally true for all species, they produce more offspring than the environment can support. A lot of these offspring do not survive and reproduce. So those two big observations allowed Darwin to come up with his first inference. And the first inference is that individuals who have these inherited traits that give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in whatever environment they happen to live in, they tend to leave more offspring than individuals like that live in the same environment, but they, um, they, they don't have quite the same level of traits. So in this case, we can see that this seahorse right here that um, looks an awful lot like like the kind of corally background um, the ones that happen to look a little bit more like the background are more likely to blend in and survive and if they survive maybe they're more likely to reproduce right that's this extremely important inference number one individuals who Inherited traits gave them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a specific environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. This only works if, of course, there is more offspring produced than can be supported by the environment. Inference two that he came up with is that this unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce is what leads to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population, generation after generation after generation. One huge influence on Darwin that we haven't talked about yet is this um, guy named Thomas Malthus. And Malthus was not a biologist, he was an economist. And he was making observations about humans. He said that humans human populations tend to increase faster than food supplies and other resources. And so Malthus um, was basically talking about exponential growth. So that's this curve right here, exponential growth. And of course, you know, you've got a lot more people, so you can make the food supply grow, but that's not at an exponential rate. And so Malthus was really freaked out and worried that humans population was going to just like get to just crash really, really hard. Um, so Darwin took this idea about this idea of overproduction and about scarcity of resources, and he applied that to natural populations. You can kind of think about this um, in in the way that Darwin did. He he said that individuals with advantageous traits would be more likely to survive 
in adverse conditions and avoid starvation. If those individuals, I mean the, the ones that survived, of course, produced more f- surviving and fertile offspring, then this would mean that the proportion of favorable traits, as long as they're heritable, this is so important, those would increase in the population over time. So if you think about this population of beetles here, you got some brown ones and some green ones. And if the birds can see the green ones, then the brown ones have the favorable traits, right? And so those are the ones that increase in um, the population over time. Darwin uh, reasoned that um, it, it didn't matter how big or, or how small those advantages are. Natural selection should over given enough time, you know, this could be hundreds and hundreds of generations, this could be thousands of years, but given enough time, you will start to see dramatic modifications over time. Um, and uh, as as these favorable adaptations increase, they result in individuals being more and more well adapted to their environment. In the example here, you can see some uh, moths that had variation in their appearance. Some were darker, some were lighter in an environment where the trees that they lived on were um, mostly white with some dark spots. This made sense. Over time, with pollution and the Industrial Revolution, um, the the, um, trees and moss and rocks all became very soot covered. Think about all these coal plants just kind of like exuding coal smoke and where that coal coal smoke settled was, um, was just basically everywhere. And so the moths that blended in to this new environment were the ones that were better adapted. And those are the ones that increased in their Um, population over time. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this example is that these two moths, even though they look very different from each other, they belong to the same species. And these two moths also belong to the same species. The time frame here is just very short, you know, a a few years, a total of 10 years here um, over time. But so that's not enough for a new species to evolve, but it is enough for, especially in in a dramatic change of environment, for the species to become radically different in appearance. Individuals with with inheritable traits um, that survive and reproduce at a higher rate than other individuals is a key feature to natural selection. You've got to have inheritable traits and differential survival and reproduction. Over time, natural selection increases the frequency of one adaptation over the other. And importantly, if an environment changes, natural selection might result in adaptation to the new conditions, sometimes if given enough time, giving rise to new species. One of the things I like about this picture is it looks like you're looking at a couple of flowers, but that's not the main focus of these pictures. We're actually looking at a couple of praying mantises, which you see here and here. Both of these have adapted to the individual flowers that they tend to live on, and um, praying mantises like to sit and wait for prey to come their way. So this praying mantis might be waiting for a bee to come to this orchid and just pounce on it. Same thing for this. Of course, if this praying mantis lived on this flower, this area where this flower exists, probably would not, um, would be seen by the prey and the prey would avoid it. So this idea of blending in, it works for both predators and prey. One other key thing to remember, and this is so easy to forget when you're studying evolution for the first time, is that it's populations that evolve, not individuals. It's not like this little individual praying mantis right here. It didn't, you know, um, happen to say, oh, you know, if I, if I look more like this flower, I could, I could, uh, survive and reproduce more. It's not how it works. 
it's really important to keep in mind when we think about populations evolving that it's the type that blends in worse is the type that doesn't do well and the type that blends in better is the type that does better blending in isn't the only way that natural selection happens of course it's just really easily visual to talk about when we're looking at um, when we're looking at lecture slides so natural selection itself works at the population level not on the individual level it's not causing change in an individual also, it's important to realize that natural selection can only increase or decrease the frequency of that trait in the population, among individuals in that population, but it doesn't cause a new variation to exist by itself. We need mutation for that to happen. Specific traits that are adaptive will also vary from place to place and over time. So while one trait might be great in environment A, it's not so great in environment B, and it, it changes over time. So while it might have worked really well for a species in the past, you know, nowadays maybe it doesn't work quite so well. So all of those things are key to understanding Darwin's big ideas. The next part that we're going to talk about is evidence for evolution. So we'll hit that when we come back for part three of chapter 19.